Konnichiwa, everyone. Aloha. Naimbag, uh, I guess it's Aldao. Naimbag Aldao. Yo amin. My name is Rebecca Maria Goldschmidt. I'm an artist and I forgot to hit record on my artist talk, <laughs> but just for the beginning. So I'm here, I'm just gonna do a kind of replay of the first part and then um, plug back into the, um, kind of about like 10 or 15 minutes into it. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen really quick here. And yeah. Uh, cool, yeah, so thanks for everyone who came to the talk and to anyone who's tuning into the recording. I'm going to talk a little bit about my project called Yama no Dengong, uh, Mountain Messages that I've been working on here in Hiroshima. So first, just if you're I'm going to maybe just do this for myself right now, but I'm going to just stretch uh, and just wanted everyone to, as we're, you know, coming together um, to listen to these stories and talk a little bit more, just kind of get grounded into your place um, where you are in your room or in your house or if you're on the go. Just really want to invite everyone who's listening to Take a couple of deep breaths and just ground yourself and take a couple moments to acknowledge yourself for coming today to listen. The land that you're on, wherever you are in this amazing, beautiful planet. Maybe the mountains or the rivers or the trees and plants and animals that are surrounding you. Yeah, just taking a couple moments to give gratitude for, for where we are, to our friends and family, and just really grateful for everyone for listening in today. Mm. Thank you. Thanks for being here. So I'm going to share a little bit about this work that I've been doing. I am here in Hiroshima at Hiroshima Shiritsu Daigaku, which is the Hiroshima City University. And I'm going to basically give a little bit of context to where I am and a couple of maps before I go into further talk about um, the work that I've been doing. So this picture right here is actually just looking out from my window where I'm sitting. And it's covered in a little light dusting of morning snow. This mountain um, some people call it like the Hiroshima Alps. It's not really that, not as epic as the Alps really, but um, still a beautiful mountain range. This mountain that kind of comes off the edge here is called Mount, uh, it's called Yamamotocho. And there's also a couple other mountains, Mitakiyama, um, Uchausu, just different mountains in the area I wanted to bring in their names. Um, so that would be Yamamotocho. And this is just kind of a pic of where we are. I just took this from the bus stop the other day. And you can see there's someone, an auntie here who lives in this house, um, clearing her field. I know she takes care of these plots here, which is, um, and there's another one further back that's also rice, but cabbages and all different kinds of vegetables. These guys back here also have a plot with taro and persimmon tree and stuff like that. So there's still, um, even though we're kind of on the outskirts of the center, the urban center of the city, it's still kind of a suburban urban um, combination zone, uh, kind of crossover zone that is Back here, of course, um, a, a bigger mountain eco ecosystem and then further down kind of more roads and there's a big tunnel that cuts through the mountain to go into town. And it takes about 15 or 20 minutes to access the downtown area of Hirosh Hiroshima from where we're from. So we're kind of on the edge of, of the city. And this is my little uh, spot perch up here. And um, that's where I'm sitting right now. That this kanji means uh, ie, which is house. So here are a couple other views. This one here on the right, um, this is kind of from the, almost the 
not the top of the mountain, but up on the mountain looking down to some of the construction that's still happening. This actually was all built in the 90s and this mountain was kind of cleared off and re-landscaped. And this is like a big pile of sand that they just keep moving around up there. I don't know if they're trying to build something, but um, it's very much, uh, you guys can kind of see in the background, there's like houses and then there's an incinerator and there's a soccer stadium on this side. So there's a lot of stuff going on, but it's also in the midst of all of this many, many, many mountains. Japan is a land of many mountains. And this picture here is a view from the bus on the, on the um, bridge when you come out of the tunnel on the other side of the mountain. So we're kind of like on this side. Um, there are a lot of rivers. Hiroshima is a delta and so all of the water comes down from the mountains and flows out into all these different tributaries that lead into a series of river systems that flow into the Seto Naikai, which is the Seto Inland Sea. And the sea has also many, many islands on it. And it's not um, like how it, maybe it is in Hawaii or in in the Pacific in California. It's an inland sea, so it's a protected sea, and so it doesn't have a lot of waves. It's very flat, but it actually does have really high tides. So there's a lot of water that comes up from the ocean into the rivers and then, then flows back out. Um, so in the morning when you go down here, this river is pretty low and it's actually, you can see the bottom of the river coming out. So these are some of the questions that I've been thinking about since I've been here in Hiroshima now that you kind of have a basic idea of where I am and I'll talk a little bit more about where I am in a second. Um, but these are kind of the ideas that I'm thinking coming out of my doing my master's in Hawaii and really thinking about place and what it means to be in a place um, that isn't quote unquote home or your traditional lands. I really wanted to think more about connecting to land in new places and new contexts. So if we are people of diaspora, which many of us are, I'm not from Japan, I'm not from Hawaii, um, how can we develop or practice our ancestral rituals, our ancestral practices of honoring and respecting land from wherever we are? no matter where we are and how can we do that in support of um you know and reciprocity with the land itself and the people of the land where we are and um on the same note how can we build relationships in those ways within contamination zones what does it mean um to be living in post-nuclear landscape or nuclear ecologies how can we reckon with the traditions and the ritual practices that our ancestors have had while also operating within these landscapes that are contaminated. And how can my work in general and a lot of the work that you know many of you guys are doing as environmental activists, as social justice people, as artists, how can we continue to support and intersect um, with indigenous and also intersectional movements environmental movements um, calls for justice and specifically for demilitarization because at the end of the day nuclear issues are military issues and all of we also know that the military is the number one polluter on earth so how can we find out um, how we can perpetuate our relationship to land, maintain it, develop those relationships and at the same time use those to be um, you know, continuing to advocate for demilitarization and uh, um, turning back to a, a, a thinking that is about sustaining life and not taking of life or destroying of life. So a couple more maps before I get into all the rest of the stuffs. Here is, uh, speaking of military maps, I believe this is also an American military map that's a topographic sketch of Hiroshima with elevation. And you can kind of see here are some mountains and I think I'm actually on another mountain range that's right past this one, but the tunnel that I was talking about basically cuts through these mountains right here. So I'm probably somewhere on the map, like around here, which is kind of matched you can kind of see how it matches um, here with the Peace Memorial Park in Hiroshima, the downtown area right here, 
and um, this being the tunnel that I'm talking about. And this is the campus where I'm at. And then my building is kind of somewhere, let's see, over here somewhere. So yeah, just kind of the bird's eye view version. Again, you can see a lot of the river systems that are coming through into the ocean. And also just really wanting to reorient looking at this place, not as only a site of disaster or only a place where, you know, this was the first use of the atomic of an atomic weapon during war. I really try my hardest to, um, you know, to respect the stories of, of the people who died here, to respect the history, and also to see Hiroshima as part of a bigger landscape of a much longer timeline that isn't just about what America did in this place. Um, this is a, a place of history, a place of relationship with the ocean, a relationship with the land itself, the mountains, and um, yeah, just kind of trying to think about how we can see this place in, an, in, in different ways that include the ecology and don't just center the mushroom cloud. And in the same way, I wanted to sort of reorient how we are looking at the archipelagos that we're coming from and thinking about. So Japan over here, like here's Hiroshima right here, basically, um, kind of just flipping the map a little bit and reorienting the relationship between these groups of islands as being much more um, visible, maybe. I think a lot of times the maps sever and cut off Japan and isolate Japan and isolate the Philippines and do not include even Taiwan or Okinawa or the Ryukyu Islands over here in the middle or the Batanes, which are over here. But I think this map really helps us kind of see this greater connection to each other in this way. And that's kind of what I've also been looking at in terms of ceramics and the relationship between some of these things um, culturally. And I think this is the last map that I want to show, but I wanted to talk a little bit about how archaeologically the area has also been kind of divided. And a lot of us have already been doing a lot of thinking and work around colonial landscapes and maps and geography and how things are divided in these really unnatural ways. And to me, this seems like a very unnatural <laughs> division. Um, of this, this sort of lines that are drawn between zones. Uh, this is about, this map refers to the Austronesian settlements, um, archeological remnants of Austronesian settlements in these different island areas. So obviously Oceania is enormous and we're all connected and we are all related in one way or another. Going back, you know, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about Neolithic pottery, but um, we don't know all of the ways that we're connected. We only have pieces of pottery that can tell us these stories, but we do have that. And based on those material leftovers, those kind of shards, um, this is how archeologists kind of divide the space as zone one being the most inhabited, zone two being like a little bit less inhabited and zone three being not inhabited at all, or at least not having any archaeological evidence. Again, I just want to preface this and just, or just kind of like side note, say I'm not an archaeologist, I'm not an expert, but I enjoy reading the studies and I like looking at the research. And I know there's a lot of debate, like where did Austronesians come from? Did we come out of Taiwan? Did we come from China? Did it, we come up from, you know, there's Malaysians too, especially when we're thinking about the Philippine context. But I guess I just try to keep reminding myself that no matter what the origin is, um, there was so much exchange and so much trade and movement and relocation and settlement that was happening in these times, like in the, our pre-colonial days, that um, I don't think it's really possible for us to really fully understand what that was like. But I definitely see these divisions here as being, mm, you know, not that they're totally questionable because I'm sure it is difficult to inhabit some of these outer islands or difficult to get to, but I'm, I don't want to say that there just is no connection between Japan or Okinawa and Taiwan and 
especially Cagayan or the Batanes here, because they are so they are so closely related geographically and also in terms of biodiversity of fish and stuff like that. So, anyways, I'm just saying all that to just it's a nerdy, nerdy kind of way to look at um, the islands themselves, kind of rethinking the archaeology. And then for me specifically, really looking at the connections between Japan and Philippines, how can we rethink the maps? Because these lines are not helping us understand ourselves like in a broader archaeological um, geographical framework that would that would allow a little bit more connection and yeah. So lastly, I wanted to add a little bit about the kuroi ame or the black rain. So I'm not going to show any graphic images of Hiroshima or any kind of, um, yeah, destruction images, but I did want to share a couple of maps that basically are demonstrating different ways that researchers have documented the anecdotes and the oral histories of the black rain and where it came down. So you guys can kind of see here Hiroshima, the outline of the delta, and then all of these maps are just basically showing documentation of where the rain fell. So after the bomb was detonated above Hiroshima, it uh, caused obviously an enormous blast and explosion and heat wave that created fires that were burning all over the city and it eliminated pretty much two kilometer radius of the central part of downtown Hiroshima and through that process of course so many people died thousands and th tens of thousands of people died kind of immediately and obviously we know there's long-term effects of radiation etc but there's also um an enormous rainstorm that started about 20 minutes after the, the blast. And it pretty much just poured rain for, let's see, I guess here it says up to four hours. It was, um, it, that, that it, it, let me see, is that one coming after four hours? Either way, the, it rained for a long time after the, um, after the bomb occurred and essentially that rain cloud drifted over into various sections of the, the area of the mountainous and agricultural areas. And for a really long time, pretty much un up until last summer, the victims or the survivors of the black rain were not actually considered survivors of the bomb. They were just sort of these outliers and they have been consistently advocating for the rights in the legal system to achieve a status of hibakusha. Hibakusha is the name for the survivor of the atomic weapon. Um, and they have just last year been able to win their official, you know, um, sanctioned position within the Japanese government as being able to claim that title of, of Hibakusha, as well as have access to the full spectrum of medical care and other uh, support that the government gives them. So that's a really big, huge, huge win, not just for the, the, the Kuroi Ame Hibakusha, but also for other people in the world who have been exposed to radiation and radiation fallout. Um, in other situations, not just experiencing the immediate impacts of an explosion, which is not really, this is really um, the only place where that happened was, was in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, at least in the war context, not in testing. So there's a lot, there's a lot, I could go off on a lot of that kind of stuff, but I wanted to share that the place that I am now um, here in Hiroshima Shiritsu Daigaku is actually right in the area. It moved, uh, the rain cloud moved directly over this area. So when we are talking about the, ec the ecology of this place and the aftermath of those kinds of incidents, this particular landscape is also a, a of survivor landscape or a witness landscape to what actually happened here. And it is important for me to understand that as someone who is working with material coming out of this landscape, um, 
at the same time, uh, I've been taught that the material, the radioactive particles that could potentially still be in the landscape here and, and still are, um, that, for example, there was a study done in Nagasaki that the material from the radioactive tests uh, material from the different atmospheric tests around the world were also found deposited in the soil in Nagasaki. And there was more of that material from tests that happened outside of that bomb um, that were found in the soil. So people ask, well, why is it that you can live in Hiroshima, but you can't live in Fukushima or you can't live in Chernobyl? So um, it really is about the level of contamination and also that there are so much, there's so much more contamination that happened outside of these two particular places that have also, we have to realize, have also contaminated the entire planet. And that, um, yeah, I think one of my professor even says at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, um, at the deepest point in the ocean, um, they've found this material from those tests. So just trying to give a context of like where I am geographically and then also the the ecological history um, that that the landscape here is containing. Okay, and then cut to me. Yeah, now you guys go to the context and I'm going to move into a couple of other different things. Um, these are some of the kind of main issues that I was really grappling with in trying to do this work. Um, one is a radical acceptance of intergenerational trauma, war, assimilation, and displacement. So as a Filipino person and an American, a Filipino American and a Jewish person coming to Hiroshima, um, really feeling all the different feels of how my different communities have related to this place and how working through thinking about a lot of these things touches so many different areas of our lives um, and, and seeing how war really has impacted all of the communities um, that, you know, militarization continues to, to have its impact broadly. No one is not affected, basically, and that we coming to a realization of that and a confrontation with that is important for us to grieve um, the past histories that we haven't been able to. I think especially in the Filipino community, reckoning with our relationship with Japan after the occupation, uh, the Japanese occupation of, of Asia and, um, you know, Southeast Asia and uh, Korea, a lot of different countries, reckoning with um, seeing Japan as a victim of the bomb, but also as a perpetrator of war crimes. Also confronting ecological grief and the sadness and horror and terror of nuclear power and nuclear weapons and how that has affected people and the planet. Um, and then learning from um, different philosophers and thinkers on how, how do we move forward. So Michael Martyr is someone I've been looking at a lot who talks about um, dump philosophy. Basically, it kind of seems really depressing, but we're living in this toxic planet and how do we live and figure out ways to move through that are still beneficial to, to ourselves and our communities. And then last couple points, what is uranium here to actually teach us? Like if uranium and all of these other materials and metals and um, you know anything that goes into making weapons has its own agency in and of itself, thinking about a rock being alive or a stone having um, kind of animacy. If that is a reality that we can imagine, then what are these materials doing here and what are they trying to teach us? So really thinking about, again, learning from the mountain, learning from the messages that the mountain is inhabiting and sharing with us. And again, working from the periphery, there is this sort of hierarchy of peace in that um, the way that our governments have decided to imagine peace the way that the state has imagined to uh, has imagined peace for us doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way that we want it to happen right um, and and Hiroshima often gets painted as this place of peace um, but might not necessarily that might not necessarily mean demilitarization or a, a divestment from certain things it might just mean a sort of kind of like peace washing <laughs> like pretty like peace signs and, and doves, but not much more than that. 
Okay, now I'm really gonna get going. Kuzu. So kuzu is kudzu, if you guys have heard of that plant. It's a very prolific vine that grows all over this mountain. So it was one of the first plants that I noticed. I was like, whoa, this plant is everywhere. And I had seen it before in Georgia. I've seen it in the south. And I know that it's just like one of these plants that just destroys uh, an ecosystem because it climbs prolifically and just tears down trees. Like it, nothing really stops it. Um, but in Japan, it kind of the winter sort of tones it down. It's been called the plant that ate the south in the American south and uh, southeast area. And yeah, it's just has a really bad reputation in the South because it has been so prolific. It was brought over like during the Dust Bowl days to kind of um, rejuvenate the soil and to stop soil erosion. But then it just went off because it was so hot down there and there's nothing to stop it. There's not enough winter for it to like temper, to, to temper it. So here's just a picture of the, it growing here by my, by my house. Um, climbing on top of this beautiful Japanese maple and I always just want to cut it down because it's it's just too much um, so I started working with it and there's a couple of different it, it shows up in Japanese mythology which is this picture here on the left there's a story about a man who goes into the woods and he sees a fox that's stuck in a trap and so he decides to um, he decides to free the the, the fox and let you know let it go and it runs away and then a little bit later he ends up getting married to this beautiful woman and they have a child and the child is about three years old and one night uh, the child discovers that his mother is actually the fox and the fox mother realizes that her sort of illusion of her motherness has been revealed and so she decides that she needs to leave so in the middle of the night she escapes and she writes a poem on the screen and um it's kind of this story about uh the illusion of reality um the illusion of who people are in our lives the kind of thin connection between the spiritual world and the the real world and the, the child himself ends up going on to become an astrologer and a diviner and a person who is a kind of like assistant to the courts, to the emperor who kind of tells, the, not like a fortune teller, but a kind of like shamanic character who um, they say because he has this sort of relationship to the supernatural, his mother was sort of the supernatural figure that he then became someone who could... Um, do geomancy like reading the soil like reading different ways of um, interacting with the elements of the world so i'm just going to show a couple more slides of how kuzu has taken some bamboo in the area another version of kuzu noha which is the um, kuzu noha is the the mother character the mother fox here's another kuzu noha and kuzu itself also was a material that was used because it was really light. It takes a really long time to process, but it was used as like a summer garment. So this one here on the left is actually a firefighter, like a ceremonial samurai firefighter garment, which is just so cool. And the one in the middle is um, uh, a general. Uh, there's also some kuzu elements here. And then this one on the right, I think is just a, an undergarment, a samurai undergarment, samurai underwear for those who are <laughs> wondering. Um, so these are all different ways that the material was used and it was always very fine. It's still only really made in one prefecture in Shizuoka. But um, yeah, the, the process of making it kind of was taken like, cotton sort of took over and I guess hemp probably took over and then cotton took over but um, it's not really used that much anymore but I was interested in how it was used traditionally so I basically just watched some YouTube videos and did some reading and started harvesting my own kuzu just from the downstairs you know just right here in front of the house it's literally everywhere I just walked out the door and it was right there so I've harvested it and I boiled it and I started processing it myself and I started making rope. And the reason I wanted to make rope, one was because I was already doing that in Hawaii with coconut material and trying just to get to know the materials around me. But I also knew that in my studies of ceramics, which we're gonna get into right now, that rope and textile was 
um, often used to imprint and make um, you know forms and shapes and texture actually made the pot heat up faster like there's different reasons why people used it it was not as slippery when you grabbed it you know if you're cooking something over the fire it's easier to to um, use some kind of thing to grab onto if it has a sort of texture um, so I started working on that and I started looking into the history of jamon pottery which is this on the left hand side uh, the jamon jamon even means cord marked like rope marked um and this isn't this is like the coolest pot ever i mean the, if you guys look into the jamon stuff it's just like totally alien really really trippy stuff so um recommended and um on the right is the manungal jar which is our heritage pot of the philippines it's like kind of um one of the most well it's the, the most well preserved and um studied uh, burial jars that we have and it has this image of someone moving into the afterlife being paddled by the the canoe paddler taking him across the river of life um, and into the to the underworld so there you know for me visually there's all kinds of different weird connections here I wasn't really trying to do the extreme work of being like well, Philippines had just as good of pottery as Japan. Like, I, it's not really interesting to me, but I did think that it was important for us to kind of think about, based on that map, you know, the zone one, two, three, there had to have been interaction and crossover and something going on. There was no hard boundary between these islands. People were moving all the time. So just seeing the stuff like this um, and putting it into context with each other, I think is important. And that really doesn't happen in the, art historical context. It's very much about Japan and very much about, you know, maybe the Ryukyu Islands um, and the center kind of Austronesian Okinawa and stuff like that, and then Southeast Asia. So just kind of, again, trying to blur those boundaries a little bit. Here's another Jamon pot. And here are some of the marking, the pottery markings that I was looking at um, that connect the Bismarck Archipelago, the Marianas, and Cagayan, which is the northern part of um, the Ilocos in the northern Philippines. And that these shards do kind of have this crossover between certain imagery that was drawn, certain patterns that were drawn on the pots. Um, and with, that gives us basically a historical archiving of where people moved through the islands and whether or not they were related. Um, and then I wanted to share a little bit about the Tingyan people and their understanding of jars. So vessels in general, in many cultures have this sense of um, multiplicity and re uh, reproduction and um, abundance because they hold water, they hold food, they help us cook, they are related deeply related to us in our ability to survive. And so in certain cultures in this particular, these particular talking jars are from the Tingyan people in the Cordillera. And they're actually probably not made there, they're made in China most likely, but they were used uh, or they were seen as sort of heritage items, like something that you would inherit and pass down. And they were, they were also animate and talking and they, have stories of um, one jar in particular that was that had a girlfriend and had a child, um, Magsawi, and that the the jar would move on its own and travel to places. So they th the jars also have a really long history because we're also um, we use them as our burials in the Philippines. We would put the bones of our ancestors inside the jars and put them inside caves. We have a deep connection to the jar as a a portal or an access to ancestor as well. And I know Anea is here and there's other people here who work in ceramics. So I'd love to hear people's like stories and stuff at the end because there's a lot um, to cover. Here's another image of, uh, or here's an image that Anea actually shared with me. Thank you, Anea Agyamanak. Uh, 1927, women in the Ilocos working with their pots. And you can see here they're round bottoms. They're working with the anvil and the paddle. So they're kind of like bunk, 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 like making a round pot like this. Um, and then these are smooth, but sometimes that paddle would be wrapped with rope and that would give the imprint um, on the on the um, clay. 
And then I was also, of course, looking at other pictures of there's sort of this trope of the beautiful woman carrying the pot or the water bearer. And this kind of is repeated a lot in the history of Philippine painting, Philippine um, photography. It was kind of a trope that the um, um, like the colonial photographers who were documenting like Dean Worcester, who were documenting the different cultures, they would have the women hold the pot or perform the pot because it was sort of like this ancient um, technology that people were still working with. Here she is like going to the water or whatever. And here is a pot that is called a chatsubo, which was the pot that was actually brought from the Philippines to Japan and used in tea ceremony. And so this was the point where I was really interested in, in the late 1500s, how did the Philippines overlap with Japan in terms of pottery, not just from the ancient cord marked stuff, but where else were those intersections happening? And it happened with tea ceremony, which is, you know, I don't know if folks are familiar with tea ceremony, but it's really like um, a foundational aspect of Japanese culture and um, sets the standard for different ways of being, modes of being and interacting for, for a lot of the, the culture even now. And so when I found out that many of these chatsubo were actually called Ruson tsubo, like Ruson, the island of Luzon, um, I just kind of started to dig in more into what that meant for us in our relationship to Japan. Um, what does that mean to, to have a sort of foundational aspect of Japanese culture also be contained and held and supported um, because the material or the, the jar itself would be where the tea leaves would ferment inside. And so the Japanese thought that these particular jars were the best jars for this to, they, they functioned the best and they also looked the best for the, the sort of um, tea ceremony aesthetic, the sort of wabi-sabi aesthetic. So, oh my gosh, I just have so much to say and I know I'm not gonna get to all of it. So I'm gonna jump ahead. Ash, um, ash is something that I really wanted to work with because of its relationship, obviously to Hiroshima and fire and transformation, but also because of my family's relationship to Auschwitz and the camps in Germany and the Holocaust. So this is actually a monument to Holocaust um, victims to Auschwitz it actually contains the ashes of Auschwitz victims inside. And this is at a temple, a Buddhist temple in Hiroshima. And there are a lot of relationships that exist between Hiroshima and, um, and what happened in Germany. And I won't go that much into it, but ash was a material that I wanted to work with that also um, historically in Asian pottery has been used for glaze. So I started making my own ash um, using the leaves from the bamboo that I was harvesting, turning that into ash, mixing it and glazing the pots from there. And kind of just, again, kind of wanting to step away from the co commercial ways of working with the art materials and just really look at what can we make from the, the materials that are here. I was doing some imprints and again, just really fascinated, just putting the um, plants directly into the kiln and just kind of seeing what was coming out, the sort of the ghost, ghosting effect of the ash. Um, and then working with bamboo, of course, has been always a pleasure and learning from that material. And I really thought of bamboo from what I've understood about what happened in Fukushima, bamboo has consistently been, um, a uh, sort of container for nuclear contamination. It stores cesium and different uh, elements in its root system and even throughout the whole tree and the branches itself. It's actually grass, but in the, in the stem of the grass. Um, but once this material, once, this, once these plants are contaminated, they're technically nuclear waste. You can't just burn them or get rid of them because all of that stuff is trapped inside the bamboo or in the plant. So how do we think about these plants, these, you know, these, these friends, these relatives of ours as then being also contaminated and holding the contamination? So that's where I started thinking about, um, I, I decided to make molds of the bamboo 
and thinking about thinking about them as fuel rods or containers for the uranium that has been mined from other places, transformed through these long processes of creating uranium pellets, which is the sort of image I'll show next slide here. Um, this is essentially when you mine uranium from the earth, it comes out as like a rock. And then there's a really, really long process of turning it into this, <laughs> turning it into um, a, a piece of material that can be combined. And when we harness the power that comes from it, it, it is equal to these things like about a, a ton of coal, 150 gallons of oil, or 17,000 cubic what is that? Meters of natural gas. So it is extremely powerful. It is it contains so much energy, but the process of getting it to here also takes a lot of energy. And then if we have any kind of um, nuclear event, incident, disaster, um, it is an extremely dangerous material to all living beings. So it's kind of that question of like, is it worth it? Is it worth it for us to produce these these small little bits um, to continue to power our systems, our societies, uh, when it also has these extreme detrimental effects. So now I'm getting to the actual installation and that, thanks for bearing with the whole, there's a lot of background and I, I have so much research, I can't even share half of it here, but um, this was the installation that I ended up creating, which to me was really an offering to this particular place to the mountain where I'm at, to the ancestors of, you know, the people, the people of Hiroshima for kind of, um, you know, making space for me to be here. That includes the panel of professors that accepted me to be here and all of the folks who have made it possible for me to do this work here. And I also saw it as sort of a, a connection to my own ancestors and a gratitude to my own ancestors and a sort of like reminder of why I'm doing the work. Um, so the all of the all of these processes that I went through, making the mold, making the beads, harvesting the kuzu, breaking it down, weaving it into weavings, um, all of those different processes were ways of ways that I was working through some of the more abstract um, philosophical things problems that I was working with, but um, coming to a final installation of a, of a work that was really an offering to this place and all of the people and, and things that came together to get me here. It's been a really intense journey, <laughs> but um, I made a sort of traditional Ilocano atang, which is an egg on top of rice. I did a black rice um, and I offered some fruit and nuts and raisins and stuff. And then this vessel is filled with water. So here's the atang. Here are some of the bamboo pieces. Some of the bamboos actually split. Uh, I had different stages of them. So some of them just kind of naturally split. And so I set the beads kind of inside them. Um, these are a couple of the, this is one of the weavings that I made. Uh, I wanted to also mention, I have so many notes that I can't see, so I'm probably forgetting something, but there's a historian, Mary Mattingly, I think is her last name, and she writes, she writes about Hiroshima, but she, she spoke of it as being a hole in human history, that Hiroshima just blew, and Auschwitz also, so those two um, intense ex uh, experiences of humanity just blew a hole in the timeline, in the in the fabric and the understanding of what it is to be human, um, especially one because of just like the grave physical um, and just awfulness of the physicality of what happened to people, like how their bodies were injured and destroyed, but also, um, I guess, in the sense of the people who who perpetuated these crimes were PhDs. These were very educated people. They were highly modern, quote unquote, modern intellectual people um, who came, who brought Western thinking to this ultimate point. And so really thinking about the void and 
a sense of emptiness or a hole um, and, and filling that hole, what does it mean? How do we repair that space? Can we repair it? Does it just stay there? Do we keep it as a reminder? Kind of thinking in, in those kinds of terms. Um, so yeah, here's just, again, the uh, beads kind of set into the bamboo, thinking again about the nuclear fuel rods and stuff like that. And then some more detail shots of how the ash, when I glazed um, with the ash that I had created, how they kind of turned out. And I used most of, pretty much all the vessels I used, um, those shards that you guys were seeing, I used the, the imprints, the techniques and the kind of patterns that were consistent across the different archipelagos from the Marianas, um, from Micronesia and stuff like that. And here's some of how the bamboo pieces turned out. Um, these, I did not make this glaze. This is just like a regular gold glaze that I used, but it was a black clay. Other clays are red. And here's the final um, kuzu piece. It's about 10 by 10 inches. This took forever because it just tiny little threads I never, you know, I'm not this person who's really into super tiny work. Like I know there's a lot of people like Giovanna, for example, is like really great at beading and this tiny stuff. And I'm usually not into that, but this for some reason was really a cathartic place for me to just make that um, transition from the living vine into something so tiny and small. And here are a couple more images of close-ups. This was a pine needle basket that I made kind of when I first got here. Uh, this one I really saw as like an ancestor vessel as like a, 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 a being, like it had a beingness to it. Um, and this sort of cloak of, of trash that I picked up on the mountain. That's it without the top. And uh, I wanted to talk, just mention briefly, and I'm totally over time here, but mugwort is a plant that grows very abundantly here on the mountain as well. And it also has to do a lot with, um, historically, it's been used as a fertility and a sort of psychedelic, um, another sort of plant that's used to access the spirit realm. So, um, what is it? Oh, absinthe. Absinthe, the drink, the green drink that Van Gogh drank, you know, like back in Barcelona or Paris or wherever they're hanging out. That's also related to uh, wormwood, which is related to mugwort. So mugwort kind of has this relationship to the feminine, to the divine, and um, is also another sort of access point that even in Japan and China um, has been used to access the spirit world. And I wanted to share that I also asked people what they wanted to share with the mountain. What, were, what are the messages that they wanted to share with the mountain? So some people said, I want more snow <laughs> or smiling at the mountain. And I actually haven't translated the Japanese ones yet. So I can't tell you what they say right now. I can tell you later. Another piece with the bamboo and the beads. Another small weaving that I did on a round loom. Yeah, I'm just gonna kind of flip through. And I think we're kind of coming to the end here. I wanted to leave with this saying, it's a Buddhist saying, um, when Thich Nhat Hanh died, I started listening to this podcast that one of his students does. And I can't remember what it's called, but I can share it with you guys later if you like. But um, there was a saying that someone mentioned on the podcast that was, there is a mountain there is no mountain, there is. And I really, really appreciated this teaching in thinking about how we see things, how we see things and the symbols of things, the mountain being a symbol, right? Like we can look at a mountain and be like, oh yeah, there it is, I can see the mountain. I can imagine the triangle, I can see the picture of it, I can conceptualize what it is in my head. There is a mountain. But at the same time, when we really think about it, there is no mountain because the mountain is actually made up of a million different infinite amount of particles of earth, of water, of stone, of metals, of uh, roots and bugs and everything. So the mountain itself actually doesn't exist. There is no firmness to a mountain. The mountain is actually very permeable. It moves and it changes. 
And then once we reckon with that concept of it being not what we thought it was, and it being many things that we can't really even imagine, that we can come to a place of rest, of just understanding that there is. And we don't have to see it as one thing or see it as another thing, that we're coming from a place of symbol to a place of dissolution of image, and then to a place of just acceptance of, of that being the reality. So yeah, I wanted to leave us with that. And I'm going to stop because I'm just going on and on. Um, but I wanted to give you guys also my um, email and stuff. I'll, I'm going to stop sharing here. Gosh, I never have enough time because I just have so much to say. But yeah, just going to invite everyone back to do a little bit of Q&A. I know folks are going to have to go at a certain point too. Um, so that's totally fine too. Everyone can just do what you got to do. I'm just going to look at the chat because I haven't had a chance here. How do I get out? Oh, there we go. Okay. Yay, glorious, beautiful. Oh, yay, thanks, Paula. I'm glad that you found it nourishing. I know there, I, I was really trying not to traumatize anybody because there's so much, you know. I, I don't want to go deeply into the trauma of a lot of the stuff that's here, right? But how can we use that and transform it? I think that's really what, what I was trying to do with the work. Um, so yeah, um, if anyone, hi, Caitlin, I love you. <laughs> if anyone, feel free to just, now we can just hang out. If anyone wants to, thank you, Christine, for coming. Thank you so much. Maeve says, do you have any interest in making paper with kuzu or any other plants? Yes, in fact, I would love to talk to you. Maeve is a paper maker and among other things, um, but I would love to do some more fiber stuff. I would love to do more weavings, honestly, but paper, there's an accessibility to paper that just, you don't need a giant loom. You don't need to, it's a lot easier to throw the fibers together, mash them all up, and then put it all through to a screen, you know what I'm saying? Not that it's about ease or whatever, but um, I love the idea of paper because I also love prints and I love photos. And I always wanted to make my own paper to, you know, create a base for, for images. Um, I know that uh, in the South, there's like a couple of different collectives. Thanks, Maeve. Yeah, let's, we're going to talk soon and we can talk how, about what the best way to do that would be. Because the other thing about paper is that when you're working with fiber, there's so much leftover, like there's so much leftover material that you're like, what can I do with this? And in Hawaii, I, I made some of it into paper. And then sometimes you're like, all right, I'm just going to throw it back into the forest or whatever like put, make a compost pile um but sometimes it's nice to take all those trimmings and turn it into something like that's that's usable too which is why I wanted to do the the ash it was like okay let's just burn it and then we can just use the, whatever's left to do something um yeah thanks for that question Maeve Rebecca, do you ever worry about like when working with bamboo? Because you said it holds the, and I don't know if it still contains or holds like the, um, the waste, like the nuclear waste. But do you ever worry about that, or do you think of, like not worry, I guess, but do you think about that, and does that kind of um, affect what you do with it? I worry about it every day, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, like I've been in, now I feel like I've been in other conversations with people who are studying nuclear, who are like, you know, there are people who live in actual contamination zones, like Fukushima. I'm just gonna use Fukushima as the best example, right? Like there are people who didn't wanna leave. Chernobyl too, there are older people who don't wanna leave their homes. There happens to be a nuclear plant, it freaking explodes, everything's contaminated, but they don't want to leave. And so, yes, I worry about it. Yes, I, of course, I'm always concerned about my own health, other people's health too. And then I really had to 
remember and remind myself kind of like the privilege of that worry, right? Like there are people who actually do live in these zones their whole lives. They grow up in them. And of course there, there are, um, what you calls uh, repercussions to that. I mean, reproductive cancer is probably the number one thing that happens. Thyroid cancer is usually the first cancer that happens, but reproductive um, effects are also like, you know, prominent in, in nuclear ecology. That's just how it is, right? Like that's how um, the Micronesian community, the Marshallese community has really deeply been affected and speaks to that a lot of how they're, um, the different kinds of problems they're having with reproduction and, and babies and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I, I do think about it. And in fact, usually I'm like a forager, I go and eat and I pluck and I, you know, whatever. And I haven't been doing that so much here. I mean, harvesting it, but even thinking about it, it's like, okay, well, I can harvest the material, put it in the pot and boil it in my studio odds are if this has some kind of material in it it's probably evaporating into the air and I'm probably breathing it into my studio it's probably coating you know like you can get to these like really intense places of, of like paranoia of, of, of contamination but again my professor who's speaking after this um, really just drilled it into my head he was like the testing that was done by the U.S. government in the atmosphere and the Russian government and the Chinese governments, you know, all of these different, since the 1940s, right? Since this, right before Hiroshima was the first, uh, the Trinity test. So these 75 years or whatever that we've had, like those tests have put more contamination into the world um, than this particular place that doesn't mean that this isn't contaminated, right? And, and I'm not an ecologist and I haven't um, actually need to talk to an ecologist about this area, but I have read studies. There was one in the eighties that did say that, you know, there was still um, material contaminant, like, like depleted uranium, traces of depleted uranium in the soil here in different areas. So it's not going anywhere. And I think that's the issue that we have to deal with, right? As we talk about, um, like, I find that climate justice work and spaces completely ignore nuclear as, as even a conversation topic. Like, it's just too big. It's too much. It's like, whatever. But um, yeah, it's very, very much an issue. And it's, it's a, a major contaminant in, a, in all of our lives. In fact, you know, for the folks who are in L.A., um, they just had, I think last year, there was some forest fire or something that that happened and people were concerned because there had been a nuclear accident in the 50s that no one really talked about and it had contaminated certain parts of the forest. And then when the forest burns is when it releases all that contamination again. So then of course that's going to dump, you know, it's just going to keep moving. And the, 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 yeah, the contamination just moves through the ecosystem. So how do we deal with that, right? Like it's in us, it's in everything. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of really difficult to understand, but thanks for that question. Cause that, that was a concern. In fact, the first thing I did when I got here was I emailed my professor and I said, um, what, is, what is the water like here? I said, what can I, should I be? Like, I actually do drink, like my, I keep the charcoal thing in my water because I know that that's gonna at least absorb something. I don't know, you know. Um, I'm reading Cora's note. I think that she just had to leave, but um, yes, yes, yes. I'm happy to share the recording. Uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any other questions. Rebecca, I had a question. I wrote it down in the chat. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. No, 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 you're okay. I'll just say it out loud because um, since you and I were talking, we've been talking about spirituality a lot. I was wondering if you can go into depth about how you feel, how is your connection to the spirits in Hiroshima and how, and the land and the people and how it's, how is it impacting you? Hmm. Great question. Thanks for that question, Brenda. 
Well, I must say, you know, I'm an empathic person. <laughs> it's like hard to move through a lot of spaces and not be affected um, by just the feeling of the place. And I really, really didn't want to come here and be like only thinking about the death and destruction. Like it's, it's I mean, it's inevitable, right? Like you cannot go to a place. It, it wouldn't be right of me to not acknowledge that the death happened. And in fact, I wanted to share, I didn't get to share it. Maybe I could read it. Um, there's, a, there's a writer who wrote a book called Hiroshima Bugi, B-U-G-I. Um, he's an indigenous person from Minnesota. I think he's Chippewa. Um, he's an indigenous historian and, and author. Um, and Gerald Weis, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but Weisner, Visnor, Visnor. Anyways, I can put it in the chat later. But um, that that text that he wrote really is very critical of like the image of Hiroshima as a center of peace, because he, in his way of thinking about it, he's like the. I'm you know I'm just gonna read it because it's just such an important. Um, Hold on, let me just find it real quick. Okay, this just sums up a lot of how I feel, honestly. Oh crap, one sec, one sec, just lost it, oh man. Okay, here we go. Quote, I was tormented by terrible dreams the first few nights alone here in the ruins. The horror was inescapable. I was caught in the same nightmare night after night and could not scare myself awake. The children and lonesome dead crossed over the circle in the ruins. My nightmare lasted 60 years. I was surrounded by white bones and burned puffy bodies. The river was packed with bodies that never floated out to the bay. I was dead, a heap of ancient white bones, and could only reach out for bits of passing flesh to cover my bones to create a new memory. I caught a white pigeon with burned feathers. Suddenly, the pigeon turned into an angry ghost and scorned me. Then my bones were mounted in a museum with my broken, burned watch beside me, probably as punishment for my resistance and tease of time. My body had deserted me, and my remains were displayed in a diorama of victimry to promote peace. I raged over the passive notions of peace, and then, in the last scene of the nightmare, the museum was destroyed in an earthquake. My bones were liberated by chance, and my shadow was cast in a ghost parade, a nuclear kabuki theater. I awakened in the ruins, and every morning since then, there has been a ghost parade that starts abruptly at 8.15 anti-meridium. So the ghosts, <laughs> I mean, I guess that was the question, right? Um, I definitely feel uh, a, a sense of responsibility to paying attention, especially when I go to the center of town. Not to say that ghosts are only at the center of town or something like that, but um, the way that the, the city is constructed, it's like very much like this somber park that's, um, there are actual burials there. There's the museum, of course, that does have remains. And then there's the dome, the atomic bomb dome that exists. That's like the skeleton building of like what happened here. You know, it's like, don't forget this happened here, this happened here. Um, and I think from the get go, Brenda, I always, I always um, paid attention to the river. Like that was the number one thing that I noticed when I got here, and I still always honor the river when I go. And I knew from the beginning that that's where so many people died as well, that people ran to the river as they're, you know, in this horrific scene, running to the river. And everyone knows that the river is the life of the city, but it's also, you know, holds all of that memory of the death of all these people. I mean, at least 80,000 people, right? Like just like basically obliterated. So it's, um, when I first came here, fire really was coming. Like I had a really intense visions of fire and dreams of fire all the time. And I really felt like, uh, 
I didn't know how to like stop that from happening. And that that's kind of subsided a little bit, but um, I think that's why I really turned to just trying to stay grounded in the mountain and just always giving offering, like always giving plants offerings, always just thanking this place and just being consistent with that. And in fact, there was one time I went downtown with some friends and we were walking, we were gonna walk to the river to just sit and have, I think we have boba. I don't know. I was with two girls and we start walking and we were walking past the dome and I was just going to go straight to the river, you know, but she, she's Japanese. She went, we kind of did this. We were went like this and she was going straight to like the stone where you give your honor to the, to the building. Right. And I realized I was like, Oh my God, I didn't want to go to, to offer something first to the victims, you know, like I didn't, I didn't initially frame my movement to move towards the, the building. I wanted to go to the river. Like there was just this dis dissonance between where we wanted to do that moment of just acknowledging. And I think now every time I go down, I, I always go straight to the, that stone where there are where people leave offerings of water, they leave flowers, they leave all kinds of different stuff. And um, I think I was telling Caitlin this, but on the day that I, when I passed the exam and I found out that, you know, I like got into the program or whatever, I was like, oh, thank God. I was like, the first thing I got to do is go straight to that stone and leave some flowers or something for that, that monument, you know? And so I did that and it was just, yeah, like there was, I can, all I can say is there was like a, a great response. <laughs> and when I do that, I feel the response. And so Brenda, like, I, I think that the most important thing is, you know, and this has been my research questions, like, how do we connect with these practices of our ancestors? And our Ilocano ancestors, our process was atang. It was a food offering. It was a kind of, any kind of offering that you could make to the dead and it was to not just like appease the dead but to know that the dead are not dead that they're here with us consistently always and that we are acknowledging their presence at all times so for me doing that here has been really really important because if if you don't and you don't recognize that they are here with us i mean those are so many people who where did they go you know like where did when something like that happens, um, there is no transition time <laughs> for people's spirits, you know. Um, so I think it's really important that, for me personally, my practice has been doing that. And that is maintaining my cultural practice. That is my source of relationship to the land itself and to my ancestors is by also honoring the people of this place too, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's not easy. <laughs> I'm not like, you know, I don't know. It's not, um, like you, you want to go downtown, go to the grocery store. You don't want to have to think about a river full of bodies every time you do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I think that's like, uh, yeah. Giving yourself space for what you need to do. But remembering that it's important I know we're like so past an hour but um yeah if anyone else has any random comments or questions Trisha hi mom well how are you going to put all that together for a paper <laughs> <laughs> that's what I got that's that's here. <laughs> what I was wanting to know is like France is going in the nuclear. They're going, you know, I mean, well, everyone's like, oh, climate change, and we're all trying to figure out oh, we can't go that way. Just, I mean, the world can't go that way because I mean, you're living in Hiroshima and and look what happened there. And then everyone's gonna have nuclear power and, and we already got nuclear weapons, but I'm like saying nuclear power. I mean, what, every inch of the earth will 
be poisoned. I mean, we can't go that way, but they're going that way. I mean, they say France is very nuclear and they're gonna do more nuclear. And, yeah. But Gen Germany is closing their nuclear um, plants. So I, I guess it's to each their own. You know, Germany says, okay, no, three, we're gonna close them. But, you know, when you don't want all your, you don't want everyone to be sick, so whatever. I Everyone has to be aware and then, uh, I don't know. I mean, can we vote it out? I mean, I, <laughs> yes. Can the we people can. count? Well, I mean, that's what you we have to be aware. Of. We can Everyone to be aware. You know, how much uh, nuclear do we have? Are we going to all go nuclear because we all want to get off the fossil? So everyone yes. has to, uh, right? We have to I'm be aware. So, <laughs> Just right. kidding. We need to like say no. I, I think but, you're right, mom. And mom, oh. you lived through the anti-nuclear movements. Like, do you remember anti-nuclear protests or anything well, like yeah. that? And then, and then they were showing when that happened in New York and everything, everybody was protesting, but that didn't stop it. You know, there's nuclear here in Chicago, uh, in Evan, you know, North, near the rivers, we've got nuclear plants all over. But how is all that, but I mean, your, your studies there, is all, all that that you're observing six months already, uh, is it, how is it going, how is it going to affect your art? And I mean, do you think it really affects your art? I, I, is it very stimulating for you being, you know, there and? I mean, I think to me, it seems that nuclear is this ultimate intersectional environmental issue like it brings everything together because it doesn't it affects everyone evenly you know um i i i definitely see you know when they pass the build back better thing whatever the infrastructure whenever that was going through like there are there are pockets inside that that are for nuclear enhancement. They're already putting a lot of money. I mean, it's part of the military, it's part of the military industrial complex, right? Like the more, I guess I'll put it this way. The professor who's speaking in a little bit has talked about his theory, his thinking is that nuclear was born violent, that there is no such thing as peaceful nuclear power, that there is no such thing as gr the greenwashing of nuclear power is something that's happening a lot right now. I even saw that there's like Grimes and like these other influencer model, there's a Brazilian nuclear influencer who I'm sure the nuclear industry is paying like a bazillion dollars to encourage people, especially young people, to be pro-nuclear because it's green, because it's not fossil fuel. And I think to me, that's the most dangerous place that this is going, is that it's um, being sold back to us again, because we've had that sort of memory loss of what people really tried really freaking hard to stop nuclear, you know, like, England had a really amazing anti-nuclear, the, the whole world, the nuclear-free Pacific. I mean, clearly all of the indigenous people who have been saying nuclear is awful since the beginning because they were the ones who had to mine the uranium from the ground from the first place, and they're all sick. Um, like those are the people that, and I, I think that's where I keep going back to that question. How can my work support those stories or those voices or like bring that to the conversation because I mean if we believe that we can stop something from happening I we could probably do it but it would take a lot of consensus for people to to really want to divest from that as a as an option and like you said Germany said we're out we're done we don't want to deal with that it's a mess it gets people sick then the waste that you have to deal with it's it's it lasts forever but the idea that I think the industry, the industry really just delays and delays and delays and passes it on to the next generation. So we're dealing with the our grandparents' generation of trash that they never cleaned up, that they didn't even think about 
how they were going to handle it. And we're going to die. And the next generation, like this baby right here is going to have to deal with that, with that material, you know? So I think we have to really, I mean, clearly it's a question, environmental question for all materials and toxicity and, and agricultural farming issue and all kinds of different stuff happening right the oceans but I really think the scariest thing and the thing that we can most have the most effect in is yeah is not supporting it is really not supporting it even if it seems to be this promise and again it goes back to this like illusion these illusions of solution or these band-aid solutions um to to problems yeah I don't know I'm not I don't have an answer mom because I'm not a politician and I don't have any power <laughs> but I would absolutely say that for my work as an artist um, moving to like this place I feel very uh, inspired to maintain a anti-nuclear stance and a demilitarization stance and to just say that you know, just to really just keep saying that. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else wants to keep saying that too, but I'm here for you if you want to. <laughs> well, I thank everybody for being here and listening. So grateful and happy to see everybody and yeah. If you all have any other questions, please just hit me up. Let me know. This is a cute little orange that came from this area. <laughs> I'm just going to see. Thanks, Maeve. Yeah, if anyone wants to talk more again, like or like link up on or talk about material stuff or anything, I'm happy to talk about that. It's not all about nuclear but that's important too. Mm. And Anea is an amazing potter. Mm. So thinking about the ceramic part of it was so fun. Thank Thanks, you. Julian. Thank you, Kiki. I love you. I love you guys. You guys are so sweet. Love you too. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing so much. Like, it's really easy for me to get so, like, I don't know. So inspired and um, full of love for all of the material part of it, but then recognizing on a broader picture that it is, it feels like transmutation, you know? So I give a for that one. <laughs> I really, really loved it. So thank you. Thank you, sister. Mm -hmm. this one's for you guys <laughs> this one's for all the babies out there <laughs> hey love you guys i'm gonna let everybody go hi caitlin i just want to i just want to schmooze with everybody <laughs> love you rebecca thank you okay love you brenda love you love you Beck. i love you Keith. love you so much thank okay. you for coming i yeah, love you Bye, Brenda. Bye, Anaya. Bye. Bye, Kiki. Bye, hon. Ah, love bye, you. Bye. bye, Caitlin. Hi. Um, I do want to talk to you more about the agency of material, but I didn't have like a proper question for you. But like, I just yes. interest in that and how it relates to your work. So more, more conversation. to be continued, but.